Hello, and welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. My favorite quote of the year so far comes from Jack Johnson at DI's annual convention in July. Change is destination organizations, change significantly, change quickly, or face irrelevance. Destination International's Advocacy Summit is coming up on October 15th and November 12th, and if you can be there, you should. I look forward to it every year as a place to gain clarity and perspective. Last year's Advocacy Summit was all about destination organizations coming to terms with the concepts of shared community values, empowering the stakeholder, and contributing to the quality of life for residents. While we grappled with those concepts from November to March, suddenly everything was different. In a world of COVID-19, the role of destination organizations has changed irrevocably. Aligning with the values of your residents has never been more important, and the necessity of working with stakeholders to help them survive and future-proof the destination's essential assets, well, it's no longer optional. If your organization isn't already aligned closely with its civic partners, focused on serving residents and intently working with members and stakeholders to deliver tangible recovery solutions and opportunities, then, well, as Jack says, you may be facing irrelevance. I have to admit there are stories coming in about DMOs being taken to tasks by their communities, either because they aren't perceived to be doing enough in recovery, or worse yet, they aren't actually doing enough in recovery. But I have to say the bulk of the stories I hear are positive and inspiring. Kristen Jarnigan is my guest today. I recently got to interview Kristen and Dr. Michelle Reed about Discover Long Island's response to the COVID-19 crisis and how they are managing recovery. Long before COVID, long before the rest of the industry was even talking about community shared values and stakeholder engagement, Kristen was one of those leaders who was out in front of the idea of aligning with residents, empowering members and stakeholders, and curating a digital reality for Long Island that reflects both the place and its people. Kristen is a graduate of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. She was the Senior Vice President of the Arizona Lodging and Tourism Association, and today she is the CEO of Discover Long Island. Good morning, Kristen. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's really a pleasure. Um, I will I will tell everybody that we did talk, uh, as I said, on the um, uh, Advocacy Summit uh, recording with Dr. Michelle Reed. Let's talk about that for a minute. Tell us who is Michelle Reed and why it was that important. So Dr. Michelle Reed is our new official health and wellness ambassador for Discover Long Island. It's a collaboration that we developed in the heart of COVID. um, And we just kind of saw her on a webinar that was being featured on Newsday, which is our daily newspaper. And she's a doctor, a medical practitioner. She's a school board advisor to three different districts. She's a mom and she's a Long Islander. As we say, Long Island, she's a Long Islander. Uh, She deeply loved Long Island. When I saw her, I I saw her passion and I just knew that she was the next step. You know, communicate. It's not just okay to say that we're open right now. We're not, that's not resonating with our locals and our residents. And we launched a be safe pledge like everybody else did. And it's really cute and great signage, but it's coming from the tourism bureau, right? So it doesn't have the credibility, but when we saw Dr. Reed, you know, we, we just immediately recognized that collaborating and aligning with her and having her be our spokesperson for safety protocols in the industry, guiding our efforts, as well as communicating to our residents and visitors that they can get out safely. And this is how it's really been instrumental in our continuation of recovery. So, so let's drill into that for a second, because I'm, I'm really intrigued here. Sometimes when we think about marketing tourism, we think messaging for travelers and messaging for residents as if they were independent things. In 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 your case and in Long Island's case, and I'm gonna I'm gonna drill into a little bit more of the history of your marketing stuff, but especially as exemplified by the Dr. Reed choice, it's the same messaging working with both residents and external visitors, isn't it? So I think it's what you're talking about is a mindset. And, and, and it's a mindset that I've always had, and I, I don't know how to think differently, but, but when people talk about my position, I like to say, I, I have the privilege, the, the residents and the community has entrusted me with the privilege of representing the brand of their home. This is one of the most personal products and assets to anyone. It's their home, and they entrust me with their brand. 
So that's that's my role. I, it's not speaking to the visitor or speaking to the resident. It's about representing Long Island and representing that brand in whatever way that the community and the region needs to move forward and excel. But what I'm what I'm really intrigued with is how well the same messaging works for both constituents. Sometimes we think, well, travelers got a different set of wants and needs, and the you know the local resident has a different set of perspectives. That's the problem with messaging is when the when the stuff we're telling travelers doesn't jive with what the local thinks of their destination. That's a problem. I think Doctor Reed, the choice of Doctor Reed, and the idea of a, a health and wellness ambassador is brilliant. Um, having talked to Dr. Reed, she's a great advocate for health and safety on Long Island and to the rest of the world, she's explaining literally how it is safe to travel and when it's safe to travel. And she's not pumping the idea of coming to Long Island. She's pumping the idea of coming safely, respecting citizenry, lining, lining up with the locals in terms of thinking and, and values. Yeah, you're exactly right. She, first of all, we lucked out when we, found Dr. Reed, but that's kind of how we approach everything is like, well, that would be a cool idea. Let's do that. Um, but when it's, when it's done in authenticity and it's done in a way that is, you know, you're speaking on behalf of Long Islanders, I think visitors immediately like that. I mean, we've seen in the last 10, year, 10 years, you know, over tourism, people want to feel like a local and you can only do that if you're talking as a local and on behalf of your locals and and showing your destination the way that they want to be shown. So I, I think it, it works both ways for almost everything that we do to speak to both audiences and to make sure that you're speaking on behalf of your home town and presenting your destination in that way. I think it I think it definitely better resonates with the visitor because it feels more authentic. Well, and as I said in the opening, I believe, you know, looking back over your your history and your track record and your trajectory, you've been doing this for years. And certainly COVID has put a point on it and made that that synchronicity between what residents hear and what travelers hear to be the same thing. It certainly has amplified that. But you were doing that some time ago. And I want to talk about something that really interested me when you were talking about researching what it was you wanted to be at the core content of your of your campaigns you went to locals and you came up with something that none of us ever gets to see about Long Island. Long Island's like, like, like Oz to most of us. It's a mythical place with a yellow brick road and some guys trying to sell $33 million beach houses. Right. Um, and that's awesome. It's totally awesome. And it, and it is, it's, it's intriguing, but you, you hit, you hit me up with something, which is you found that one of the axioms that most resonated with residents is they really wanted to tell their history. So Long Island, and this is what, so I, I had never been here before I took this job. I came for the interview. I had never visited Long Island. To me, you're right. It was like Oz. And I didn't even really know that the Hamptons were on Long Island. I knew they were somewhere here. And, and, and I think that sometimes we're hesitant to do that as an industry. We're hesitant to bring in that outsider that doesn't know the destination. Um, but, but basically what it allowed me to do is to see it as a visitor and to listen and, and, I had to ask the residents because I didn't know. I don't have any preconceived notion as to what this destination is. And what I learned right away was that Long Island has the largest population of veterans of any other place in the country. And Long Island loves their veterans. We have incredible military and aviation history. Um, we're the home of Teddy Roosevelt. We're the first, they called it the first summer White House. It's a national park. We're the home of the Culper Spy Ring, which uh, inspired the series Turn, um, which is a, a very popular uh, cable series. So when I started talking and I, when I went to the veterans, I went to the rotaries, I went to the libraries because um, I was learning. And that's what they told me. And, and if you look, I looked at all of our marketing, it was all beaches. And let me tell you, the beaches here are amazing and pristine, um, but that's a very seasonal thing. And when I talked to the locals, what I learned and what I thought was really awesome was all the history and that's what they talked about. And so when we did our first campaign out of the gate, I had to fire my ad agency, by the way, that had been here for 15 years because they thought that was the worst idea ever. I was going down a terrible path. Beaches are what we known for. That, that's the only thing we should talk about. That's our brand. Um, but so we did it all in house. We, we got the images, we had graphic designer laid out. We wrote all the copy. 
And we did a, a series. It was like, oh, say, can you see SEA by the dawn's early light? And we showed the first White House commissioned by George Washington. What so proudly we hailed. And we talked about the history and the Vanderbilts and the Belmont Stakes. And, and at the Twilight's Last Gleaming was Jones Beach Theater and some entertainment. Um, and I took that campaign around at the time. We were very small and uh, didn't have our team in place yet on boards, on like little, pl- what you see behind me. And I took it to chambers. There's 120 different chambers of commerce on Long Island. I went to all these different meetings and I showed them those pictures and they passed them around and people just loved them. They were so proud. They were so proud to share this information. And that was the beginning of the turning point. Well, that, that's brilliant. And it's a monumental change. As you said, you you actually stepped back from the agency, compiled it yourself, tested it and distributed it. That's not the most outrageous thing you've done in Long, Long Island. Um, when you started, what was the name of the organization? So when I started, it, it was an organization that was about 39 years old, and it's called the Long Island Convention and Visitors Bureau and Sports Commission. And it had a very uh, scandalous path. Uh, related to that name, and plus the name was just ridiculous because, A, we don't have a convention center, uh, nor did the Islanders have left, so we don't have any really, we didn't at the time, professional sports. So it, didn't, it didn't describe us at all. And uh, so, of course, we knew we had to re, we needed to rebrand. We did some uh, research. Everything was data-driven. We found out who has the highest perspective to visit us, which there had not been research done since 2008. No one cared about that um, to do any of our ads. It was crazy. But it was great. So when we did, we did discover Long Island. And I think this is one of the things, again, that's that that thinking that I, that I say is different. You know, we didn't go and visit Long Island um, and we didn't do that for a very specific purpose because we didn't want to speak to just visitors. We want our residents who are 30 percent of our market share, particularly in off season, to discover Long Island. People have lived here their whole lives and don't realize how long I literally my neighbor today called me this morning because he wants to park in my driveway or something. And he's like, Kristen, I just discovered it's a long <laughs> island. I took my boat out last weekend. and I just, <laughs> Like you went here your entire life, but they love to tell me about it, you know, and they're so excited. But Discover Long Island speaks to visitors. It speaks to residents. It speaks to businesses and economic development because you can discover us for innovation and technology and science. So um, we were thinking long term when we did that. So it's got to be exciting. I mean, that that process and this, the transition from CVB to Discover Long Island, what, what year was it? It was it was literally one year to the date of my start date. So I started November 2nd, 2015. November 2nd, 2016, we used to have an annual meeting every year. And it was like, here's our PowerPoint. These are our sales leads. This is what everybody does. And there was some cheese and it was a cash bar. <laughs> it was sad. The first year I came here, it was day 11, the first year I came right in. So, um, year to the day, we had a whole brand reveal. We did it at um, one of our local theaters, uh, a beautiful theater that has been renovated. We had, um, you know, a whole series of pictures and, and um, an unveiling, and we had partners and sponsors, and we had T-shirts there. When you left, T-shirts made about Discover Long Island, and we gave them all away. And it was just a level of excitement that the community hadn't seen in a long time. And it was really fun to do. Okay, so we're going back to 2015-16. You're out there and you are really working at what Jack has since coined as shared community values, which I love. And I know you're a big fan as well. Um, You were working on stakeholder engagement because there's no way the product development gets done if you do it without the stakeholder. And you were working on bringing Long Island into the digital age in terms of using the right communication channels to meet the consumer where and how they shop. Fair to say? Fair to say. Literally overhauling everything. A team that had been here for every member over 10 years. Again, a a reputation kind of riddled in scandal. Um, And honestly, I'll tell you, when I first got here, you know, Long Island is made up of two separate counties. Um, And each county, and they're large. One county is one of the largest counties in the country. Um, Long Island is a $6.1 billion tourism industry. At the time, it was 4.3. Now it's 6.1. So we're excited. We have grown it. But I met with both county executives. It's one of the first things I did in my role, coming from an advocacy role before. And both county executives, which are like little mini governors, they they are both very gracious. But they said, listen, no offense, but your organization, there's really no credibility. It's useless in the past. And um we're probably going to dissolve you and move the dollars in house and just promote, you know, 
internally. And I said, well, thank you for being, you know, sharing that with me. I said, but this is why you can't do that because you're going to spend a million dollars a year, which is what you spend on tourism, promoting Nassau County. And everyone's going to think you're talking about the Bahamas. You're, sure. you're going to have a million dollars against a multi, you know, million dollar campaign that's been going on for decades. And you're going to try and brand that. I'm like, and the other county, Suffolk. No one's heard of Suffolk. No one's going to know what you're talking about. The brand is Long Island. Trust me, isn't. And I was kind of use that as an outsider a lot. As an outsider, you're going to just throw your money down the drain. Give me a chance to show you how it can work. I want to align with your economic development teams. I want to make sure we're representing the county and we're representing the destination. So, so, so going back to that civic alignment, you put it at the top of the list. You immediately went out, engaged the stakeholders, showed them what where the upside was, and you've really integrated residents. I'm going back again to 2016. That wasn't popular. That discussion was just sort of happening around the country. I was working at a tourism incubator in Canada, and we were just really grasping with this idea that the future of tourism was about stakeholder engagement, digital excellence, community shared values. It wasn't until last, last year that a bunch of those terms actually became mainstream. Like literally last year, September, this time, and as I say, we got to March and those of us who believed in those things said, you know what? The industry has turned. It's starting to understand these terms. It's starting to grapple with how do we put them into play? What do we do as DMOs and as Jack says, how do we shift? How do we change significantly? Boom, COVID hits. And each of those three literally becomes the most important existential question for destinations across the country, doesn't it? It does, but I have to tell you, I am so thankful that we've been doing that for five years. I mean, we have been doing that for five years and I have felt somewhat like chicken little in the industry. And, and, and thank goodness for people like, you know, Jack Johnson, who is saying the words out loud because just ask anyone that was in my CDME course with me that I, I went through the two year program and I feel like in every single course, um, I was the thorn in the sides of the instructors or, you know, understand like I, it's to me, it's, I, I haven't understood why we haven't been doing this the whole time. And I feel really glad that we've been doing it for five years here, engaging, again, not just the counties, but we have county, we state, we have local, we have over 900 elected officials on Long Island. Um, it's very fragmented. So it's, it's important that partnerships, because if, had those not been, had that credibility and those relationships and partnerships not been established at the onset of this, we'd be in a completely different situation than we are now. And it allowed us to activate all of those partnerships that we've had, I can, you know, that have been really instrumental during this crisis. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I had the same thought, which is, you know, we've been doing this for a bunch of years. Um, and then I started to look around the country and there were pockets. There were, there were pockets of Chris and Jarnigans around the place who were doing this, some of them on the West Coast in Canada, some of them in the Southern States, some of them on the East Coast and the, the Middle East Coast. It's great that we have this learning, but I think it's critically important right now that we shift gears quickly and that all of our peers um, begin to adopt those practices. And I, and I, I mean it with Ernest when I said at the beginning, I'm hearing rumors and rumbles throughout the industry of destinations that are being taken to task for a not doing enough but even worse destinations that are doing lots but aren't perceived to do enough so talk to me about balancing the necessity of keeping people informed about what you're doing bringing them on side making them align with you and I, you've already given great you know uh, allegorical stories going around with your initial set of uh, um, um, deck of, of, of your new creative but Talk to me about bringing people on board. So I, I can tell you, like, again, we, we had done a lot of work of changing minds and hearts in, 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 the, in the last five years. And, and people around here will be like, you know, they call me Long Island's cheerleader, you know, always being positive, always being out there, always being visible. And it's important. But at the onset of COVID, what happened was I, I, my board chairman came to me and said, listen, Kristen, what are we going to do? Because... And I will say, you know, this is one of the things I hear is a rumbling now. And it's one of the things I've been beating my head against the wall is if you don't like the way your bylaws are written, change your bylaws. It's one of the first things we did. And we made sure that we had a way to have reserves or unrestricted net assets because we didn't have them before. When I first started this job, we were paying payroll for three months out of our line of credit. Our line of credit was maxed out. And that's the way it had always been done. That's just yep. the way it's always been done. And I call it. I call it a twelve-month wheel of death. It's it scared, 
it was scared me so badly. I said, if next time you come in here with a line of credit increase, you're going to bring a defibrillator. Um, so we changed it after the first year because I just, I'm like, I can't live like that. To me, I right. can't drive. So luckily at the onset of this, we had built up, you know, almost an uncomfortable amount for my board. They're like, you have to spin down, Kristen. But, you know, what we did is we, we showed them best practices for nonprofits, not tourism nonprofits, but actual businesses that are nonprofits. And that's where I always think the stumbling block is for our industry is working in our tourism silo when we should just really talk about ourselves as businesses. Um, but I actually forgot about what your what your normal question was. I went off on that tangent about rewriting your bylaws. But well, it was about it's about how did you share what you were doing and get buy in. So you're you're on you're on track. Don't worry. So how did I thank you? How did I share what I was doing? So my board chairman said, Kristen, uh, you know, I think right now we got to look at cuts. Everyone's cutting their staff. You know, everyone's cutting their furloughing their team because you remember New York was the epicenter. So we locked down hard and fast in March. It was very difficult. And I said, I disagree. I said, this is the time where we need to be as visible and relevant and ev as ever. I said, because let me tell you, when the dust settles, they're going to look back and say, what did you do for me? And if you weren't with me in my biggest time of need, why would I come with, you know, why do I need to be with you now? And so, again, it's that, that trust that I had with my board and they let me, you know, maintain my staff. They let me do zooms and and the way we communicated is just by listening again it's listening and right at the time my my partners needed financial aid they needed to know how to get the federal stimulus how to keep their businesses open how to pay their their overhead so we had and we had relationships with all of our congressional delegation i had already an in-house position i have a vp of community engagement which i brought on a year ago who came from governor cuomo's office and has all of those relationships established and in doing that, immediately, we had webinars with every single one of our congressional delegations saying, this is how, this is my personal cell number, call me. Um, we had legal advice. I mean, we've we just been responding in real time. So suffice to say, though, that's not a big shift for you. Visible and relevant is something that's underlined your tenure since you got there. You recognize that, A, the organization wasn't visible enough, and B, you work like heck to make it relevant. In this time that we're recovering uh, from COVID, and we're literally in the process now, A, we've identified the threats we all play, face at the same time, these existential threats, and we're developing tools and approaches. Um, would that be your message to your peers, visible and relevant, if you had to underline two words? I think that's perfect. And that's what we continue to do right now. So visible and relevant during quarantine meant financial aid, stimulus, being a resource, you know, being helpful. And now what it means is being visible and relevant, being out there. So we just launched Long Island TV. I just hired, he starts on Monday, uh, or I guess Tuesday, because it's Columbus Day, uh, a new um, video director, a, a producer that we took from our TV station. He's been there for 12 years. He's coming in now, and we've got a television show. We're launching a podcast, so look out. Look out. <laughs> but it's called The Long Island Tea, Spill the Tea. Um, Spill the Tea. Spill the tea with our a play on Long Island iced tea. And you know what? It's it's difficult and it's hard because I have to tell the employees, yeah, there's no step increases this year. OK, but right. I'm bringing on another position, a high level one, because that's what we need to survive. We need yes. to show our value and our relevance. And it's a way to stay in touch. And it's a way to highlight all of our partners. We can just go show them on a video or put them on a podcast. And they're they're happy. They're happy as clams, as we say on Long Island. So one of the things I will underline here is everything we've talked about in your response has been on strategy with the way you've been executing um, Discover Long Island since you got there. I, I do want to hit on one point just to give it um, a little context. You talked about the the um, the hamster wheel of the, the 12 month funding model and having to basically go three months into credit at the end of every year just to pay wages. I think it's, I think it's one of the most restrictive things in tourism. We have been so hammered by that 12 month wheel that we don't have strategic plans sometimes to go beyond that. So in order to build what you've had to build, you have to get credit. You had to have a five year vision. And if you have a five year vision and the board buys into it, then you need to know that you've got five years of funding, don't you? Well, you know, it's interesting. I go back and forth on that, to be honest, David. I think that the five-year vision and the strategic plan, to me, that feels old school. You know, I, I tend to operate Discover Long Island as like a tech startup. 
And we move hard and fast. And we, you know, if there's a new technology platform out there, I want to know about it. We need to know if we can afford to implement it. And we'll sacrifice some places to make do for that because we want to be on the cutting edge and ahead of every everything and everyone, even though we, you know, we're a big industry with a very small budget. So our competitive set is out there. And for us to be able to do that, I have to be scrappy. I can't look at a document, you know, that, and I, I, my, my constituents don't care about my core values and my mission statement. You know what I mean? They want to know what have you done for me lately? And they want to see it and they want to see themselves in it. So um, we're actually just starting to embark on a strategic plan process as we come out of recovery, but it's not called a strategic, I won't call it a strategic plan. I, I would neither. No, I would, it a, go, what would you call it? I would call it this. You need to have a vision in your mind that people share with you that inspires them about what this place will be five years from now. That's what I call it. So, and then when I look back at how you've operated, I'd call it a five-year plan or a five-year vision because you knew you had to come out of the dark ages. You had to engage. You knew that those would become key elements of what you did going forward. You'd add to them and take away from them. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree. You know, a static document that says, here's what we're going to do. No, but a vision that says in five years, we need to be X and we're going to backfill this um, strategy with tactics. That makes sense to me. But I think what we're looking at is probably a three-year plan because I think these days, five years, um, but we're calling it a, a destination recovery and opportunity plan. And, Good. and I, 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 you know, you talk about Jack Johnson, who's amazing. I also I think I told you, I heard a podcast from Bill Geist recently yes. and it really, it's solidified because I went through all the CDME classes. I know we say, we'd say destination marketing organization, and now we're destination management organization. And Bill Guy said, you know, we're trying so hard to hang on to that M. And <laughs> why? Why? Who cares about that M? He's like, we should be definitely some leadership organizations. And to me, as soon as he said that, that clicked. And so we're leading this plan. And we're going to lead it from tourism, but it's not going to be about tourism. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all that you and Bill Geist would see eye to eye because <laughs> I, I, I've been on Bill's show and I had him on this show. And I hold up as an example of one of the things that, that very much like what you were doing, Monona Terrace, the Frank Lloyd Wright building in, in Madison, literally took 50 years to get off the ground. And the guy who drove it down the home stretch, he'll say, you give me too much credit, Peacock. But the guy who drove it down the home stretch was Bill Geist. And it was that whole re refuse to take no for an answer, act like a startup and, and, and work with the unusual suspects. Exactly. And so one of the things we just did in the heart of COVID is we got state enabling legislation introduced for a tourism recovery improvement district, um, which would be state enabling and it would allow every county to buy in. And it's something we were pushing before, but we, you know, utilize this opportunity to say, we need this now. It doesn't cost any tax dollars. Our industry's been hit the hardest. And this is the first time, again, nothing happens. You think New York is really like fast moving and, and quick? No, New York is the opposite of that. Getting anything done here is, can be very difficult. Um, and so I'm, I'm proud that we worked with our colleagues around the state and really came together to say this is important. And we just launched a new initiative yesterday, a first time, uh, the, the new Economic Development Collective, where we brought all eight industrial development agencies, which are like our economic development organizations. There's there's eight of them around Long Island, but there's not one for Long Island. They're for all different counties and towns and villages. So we brought them together as the Long Island Economic Development Collective. And we just kicked off a digital marketing campaign um, yesterday in a new microsite. And we had a great press conference that all New York City media came to. And we and we said, listen, this is when we're we're taking advantage of this opportunity. Six months ago, you know, suburbans weren't sexy, but now they are. And, you know, this is Long Island's time. Six months ago, we we were seen as a, a negative because, of you know, regulation. Now we're the best place to live. Everyone wants to live here. Houses are going through the roof. So let's take advantage of that. And, and tell people why it's such a great place. And it's been so well received. Well, and, and you know, we, we don't have time to go into the halo effect, but I, I certainly see that happening around the country. I think um, uh, Trevor Tkach in, in Traverse City would say the same thing. You know, the halo effect always said they were a desirable location. 
post COVID, it's gone through the roof. The idea of people wanting to move out of urban centers. Um, you know, I, I've certainly been plagued with that living here in Toronto, thinking about it all the time. Do I want to be out of downtown? Um, listen, we're, we're wrapping up. We, we hit our time limit, but is there any one thing you want to share? I, before I say that, it's been a real pleasure to have you. Uh, I admire the work you've done. Um, keep it up, um, being highly engaged and highly visible in Long Island. And last words over to you. Thank you. Well, I, again, I, I thank you for having me. And it's nice to know that it feels a little bit of like a relief that people are finally starting to talk this talk. And the other person I really wanted to shout out was Tori Barnes with U.S. Travel Association. She is just putting on an advocacy clinic during this uh, during this crisis. And I, I give her so much props. But the one thing I always tell people in my industry, and I said during CDME, is I think we should drop tourism from all of our explanation and just talk about ourselves as business leaders and community leaders. And I think that is really the future of our industry. Okay. And uh, you want to plug your new book? No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> when's, when, when, is your, when is your advocacy summit session? Uh, what day is it? Um, it's on October 15th. So please okay. come in. You can meet the Fit Doc. And uh, we also have our, our VP of Community Engagement uh, doing a live panel during the advocacy summit. Because it, it always makes me crazy when people say, oh, I wish I had money for a position like that. And I have no money. It's called prioritizing what your organization needs. And every single DMO should have that position. Okay, Kristen, thanks for being here. It's great to see you again. Thank you so much. 